So we're in the book of James, and as we continue through this journey in James, he continues to challenge us in how we live as believers in Christ. James, last week we looked at James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, that talked about our the use of our tongue or the misuse of our tongue. And it's it was directed directly at teachers, those who are leaders in the church. But again, all uh, individuals, everyone is vulnerable to that, and it applies to all of us. Today we're going to look at the teaching about wisdom. And as we look at this issue of wisdom, the world would argue that the Bible is outdated and doesn't apply to today. I want to begin by reading an excerpt from an article I read this last week regarding technology. He begins by talking about the fairly recent past, which some of us can remember, before the influx of all of technology. Let me just start with it. It says, The only way I knew what was happening in the world is if I turned on the radio or TV. And even then, you got a three-minute summary of what was happening, not a constant drone. Any sense of shock, outrage, or concern wasn't triggered often. And when it was, something truly shocking, outrageous, or concerning happened. Fast forward to today, and every day you encounter a thousand triggers for sadness, outrage, anger, empathy, hurt, and frustration that your ancestors never did. Today, as you've, your feed follows you everywhere, telling you about everything you don't need to know and can't really process, your senses are tripped, your senses get tripped into overload. Your brain gets hijacked intentionally triggering the anger and outrage cycles in our brains to get us to consume more. So much of social these days is angry. And what isn't angry often seems crafted to be jealousy-inducing or self-promoting. Hate, narcissism, cynicism, insecurity, and division fills our feeds. Notice that the news cycle whatever news source you favor, everything is breaking news these days. It used to be breaking news happened when there was disaster or crisis. Now a simple response to something someone else said is spun in as breaking news simply in a desperate but effective attempt to get your eyeballs. As far as envy goes, more of us than ever are pretending to live lives that don't actually exist. People with 300 followers are trying to act like celebrities who have millions of followers, and it's just not that hard to make your life look more together than it really is. We live in an age where someone's opinion about an issue becomes our opinion, where someone's reaction to an issue becomes our reaction, or our reaction to their reaction becomes what we really think. It's all too easy to read a headline watch a two-minute video rant, or see a status update and believe we understand an issue. Really? We do live in a paradox in which attention spans are getting shorter and longer at the same time. But so much of what passes as content on social is mostly undigested thought. It's fascinating and a bit concerning to me that we live in an age in which people can hold passionate opinions about something they know almost nothing about. Sadly, this even includes our faith, or lack of it. If you push the ranting, raving, and animated discussion aside and probe a little deeper, many people are three questions away from their worldview collapsing. Content consumed without content processed is useless. That's from Kerry Niehoff who I listen to quite often. So how does this relate to what we're going to be looking at today? The reality is the world is trying to hijack our hearts, and we desperately need wisdom if we are to be true to our calling to be a light to the world. James had told us in chapter 1 how we are to obtain wisdom, 
In James 1.5, he said, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. The opening verse of this passage challenges us to examine ourselves to determine whether we have true wisdom. Look at James 3.13 with me. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. This verse actually is formed in a question in the original Greek, which states literally, Who is wise and understanding among you? So he starts off with a question. But the NLT translation really it renders the overall meaning, which is challenging the person who makes the claim to be wise to demonstrate it with the works that true wisdom produces. Although James is specifically challenging those who claim to be teachers, going back to chapter 3 verse 1, the application is for all believers. James gives us two proofs of true wisdom identified in this verse. And the first one is, true wisdom will produce good works. True wisdom will produce good works. He says, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works. This first idea reminds us of what James earlier demanded, that faith manifest itself in works as well. True wisdom, like genuine faith, is a vital, practical quality that has as much to do with how we live as what we say or what we think. James reinforces the Old Testament concept of wisdom as a way of life. The attitudes and the conduct typical of a godly person. James' second proof is that true wisdom manifests itself with humility. True wisdom is characterized by humility. He says, with the humility that comes from wisdom. Humility in this passage can also be translated as meek, which if you're familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about that. What it involves is a healthy understanding of our unworthiness before God. Meekness can be illustrated by a horse that's been tamed and now can be gently led around and submitted by a bridle. For us, it is a gentle submission, submissive strength that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. The meek person seeks only the glory of God and does not cater to the praises of men. Jesus said this concerning Himself, and look at the application as well in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. He says, Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In other words, Jesus is saying, I am illustrating this humility and submissiveness to my Father, and therefore I am qualified to teach you. That meekness characterized Jesus Himself. There is a false humility that some people mistake for meekness, but it's only counterfeit. Those who claim to be teachers, but are contentious or arrogant, and have a desire to control others, is an infallible sign that the essential qualifications for a teacher are missing. For there is no meekness of character. Paul describes himself in this same way in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. He says, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ. Jesus said this about the humble in Matthew 5, 6. Again, this is where that meekness you can translate as meekness as well. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Jesus is telling us that those who have godly wisdom will inherit the whole earth. Meekness and wisdom go together. Meekness can be defined as the right use of power. And wisdom is the right use of knowledge. This goes against what the world tells us we must do in order to be successful. This brings us to what false wisdom is. And that is not godly, and it will fail. 
James describes a person with this ungodly wisdom in the next verse. He says in verse 14, But if you are bitterly jealous, and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. You see, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition prove that a person is not following wisdom. Jealousy is covetousness, and it is a root of all kinds of evil. Covetousness is listed in the Ten Commandments. And it exposes a person's heart towards their neighbor, which can lead to every sort of evil against them. Jealousy destroys the ability for someone to love their neighbor. It is evil at its core. And this kind of person is motivated and concerned about their own well-being, and they really don't care about others. That is not the type of person you want to teach you or lead you in anything. Here are a couple of questions to help us evaluate our own hearts. Do you rejoice when others succeed? Or do you have secret envy and criticism when they succeed? The second one is, do we really feel burdened when others fail? Or are we glad? See, to boast about having wisdom when one is displaying jealousy and selfish ambition, is to lie regarding the true wisdom. Boasting about having wisdom is always wrong. By the way, that's not humility, is it? If I'm boasting that I am wise, I just prove that I am not. The religious leaders who plotted and murdered Jesus boasted about their wisdom And they were liars as well. So where does this ungodly wisdom originate? Look at verse 15. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. We all have three enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And they are suggested in these words, earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. You see, jealousy and unselfishness do not originate with God. Their first source is earthly. It belongs to this world. James mentioned in chapter 1 that 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 a person would receive nothing from God if they have divided loyalties. In verse 8 of chapter 1, they said their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable, unstable in everything they do. And we defined worldly at that time. And 1 John 2, 15 through 17 talks about loving the world. Listen to what he says. He said, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. They are not from the Father, but are from this world, and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. James in the next chapter, which we will look at next week in verse 4, says, You adulterers, Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. You see, the wisdom of the world is concerned with what we can obtain for ourselves in this life. The world is constantly bombarding us to take us away from the things of God that are eternal. But if we're honest with ourselves, we don't need an external source to remove us from the things of God. The second thing he mentioned in this passage about ungodly wisdom is that it's unspiritual, belonging to our human nature. It comes from our mental and emotional ideas in our fallen nature as human beings. There's a direct parallel in this passage with what uh, Paul tells us about in Galatians 5 that lists both jealousy and selfish ambitions as coming from our sinful 
flesh. Our old nature is our enemy. Lastly in this list, it is demonic, which comes from Satan, which is out to destroy every person. You see, a lack of wisdom will lead to chaos and every evil, which ultimately is demonic. The next verse says this, For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil, and evil of every kind. That's what we see in the world. And it will also be the results in the church if Christians, especially leaders, are more interested in pursuing their own ambitions or partisan causes than caring for the church as a whole. Jealousy and selfishness destroy spiritual life and the ministry of the church. It unfortunately was in the early church and it is in the church today. Now we're going to get to the good stuff. James contrasts this ungodly wisdom with what characterizes true wisdom in the last two verses of this passage. Verse 17 says this, But the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. James describes what true wisdom is with telling us what it should produce in the life of one who has it. Wisdom is never a series of correct propositional statements, but a quality that motivates certain kinds of behaviors. James's description of the wisdom that is from above closely resembles Paul's description of the fruit of the Spirit, which is also in that Galatians 5 passage in verses 22 and 23. And the emphasis in both of these passages is on humility, peaceableness, and upright behavior. What Paul says the Spirit produces, James says that wisdom produces. They're both gifts from God. He begins by describing this with an overarching attribute that godly wisdom is pure. And what that means is that it is absent from any sinful attitude or sinful motive. It's the opposite opposite of self-seeking attitude that we saw in verses 14 through 16. From this inner quality flow the outward manifestations given in the rest of the passage. Next, he contrasts he contrasts peace loving with the bitter spirit of competitiveness and selfish ambition that were described in verse 14 as well. Next, this godly wisdom is gentle at all times. The gentle person does not deliberately cause fights but neither do they compromise the truth in order to keep the peace. And you saw this with Jesus, you saw this with James, you saw this with Paul. It's not compromise to be peaceful. And we're going to talk about that a little more at the end. This wisdom is also submissive. It's willing to yield to others. This person is easy to live with and to work with. Man's wisdom makes a person hard and stubborn. The compliant person is willing to hear all sides of a question, but does not compromise their own convictions. They can disagree without being disagreeable, and are willing to accept admonition and correction when it's appropriate. Godly wisdom is also full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It is always ready to help those who are in need. God has shown His mercy to us. He does does not give us what we deserve. And a a a wise person will imitate this characteristic of God. We can again illustrate this as we have 
in the last few weeks over the Good Samaritan. Here was a man who was merciful and who was loving towards his neighbor and taking care of him when he was in need. Godly wisdom also doesn't show favoritism. It is impartial and unwavering in its commitments. And you don't you see that with godly wisdom. You don't have favorites. It's impartial. And then finally, it is sincere. There is an openness and honesty that Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 to speak the truth in love. Whenever you find God's people pretending and hiding, you can be sure the wisdom of the world is at work. There's no scheming with God's people. James concludes the discussion of the wisdom from above by looking at peace again. Look at verse 318. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. To reap a harvest of righteousness means a conformity to God's will. A crop of righteousness cannot be produced in a climate of bitterness and self-seeking. Righteousness will only grow in a climate of peace. And it must be sown and cultivated by peacemakers. It is a peace based on holiness, not on compromise. Such persons love peace and live in peace, but also strive to create conditions of peace. Those who are peacemakers, Jesus encourages them that they belong to Him. Again, going back to the Sermon on the Mount in the Beatitudes, He says in verse 9, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Worldly wisdom will produce trouble. Godly wisdom will produce blessings. So the question is, what kind of seeds are you sowing? Because we all sow and reap, and we will reap what we sow. The Christian who obeys God's wisdom sows righteousness, not sin. They sow peace, not war. The life we live enables the Lord to bring righteousness and peace into the lives of others. So the question is, is your heart's desire to see people thriving and living a life that's pleasing to God? That's godly wisdom. And this is the primary characteristic you'll see in a Christian leader. It is to lead others into a blessed relationship with the Lord and to see them growing in it. Any other motive is selfish and self-seeking. When we have this kind of heart, we will see the Lord accomplish His work in our lives and in His church as well. But we need to remember that this righteousness, along with this wisdom, is something that's imparted to us by the Spirit of God. We do not have it naturally. The wisdom is from above. So if we lack godly wisdom and the characteristics that are in this passage... James again tells us how to get it. Going back to the verse 5 in chapter 1, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Jesus is our perfect example to model. During His earthly ministry, Jesus opposed the publicly and publicly rebuked the religious leaders of Israel. They were the ones that thought they were wise. Yet the moral and social outcast, the prostitutes and the tax collectors, experienced His love. They knew that Jesus was peace-loving and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good works and impartial and sincere. Jesus is always our example of what we are to be. And I challenge us, as I have throughout this book of James, that these are the qualities that God wants us to have if we are to achieve what God wants us to in this world, if we are going to be the difference makers, if we are going to see our communities 
and our nation turned around. We have to have wisdom to do that. We need to speak properly. We need to love our neighbors. We need to uh, handle trouble in the right way. All of these things that James is challenging us with, they need to be qualities that exist in our lives. And if they're not there, as I talked about last week, and I want to challenge this again, if those qualities don't exist, we first of all need to examine ourselves and say, am I truly a believer in Christ? And I'm not talking about struggling with some of these at times. I'm talking about it's the way we live. And we aren't even convicted about it. And we need to evaluate our lives to see if we're in the faith. And I want to talk about that in just a minute as we go in to communion. But before we go to communion, I want to open up now for a chance for you guys to pray. And do like we normally do on Sunday morning. If you can pray with those around you uh, concerning the needs that we have, uh, the things that are going on in our world and what's happening, and even praying for yourself and what God wants to do in your life. And after you've prayed, if you'll come forward and get communion. Again, we've rearranged the chairs again this week. But if you can come around this way, and go that back through that aisle. And again, if you have a face covering, if you can wear that. But come up and get communion, and then I will lead us in communion at the end. As I mentioned before we took a break, when we think about our own lives and we evaluate ourselves, and one of the things that communion should always do, it's an opportunity for us to evaluate ourselves to see where we are with the Lord. And if the Lord has convicted you that you may not even be in the truth, I always talk to people with the same example of whether you're coming to the Lord for the first time or you're returning to the Lord. What determines whether you are a Christian? Is it your behavior? No. And I think that's so important as we go through the book of James. How I act should follow what I believe. And again, it's not just belief in a propositional statement. But it is our heart surrendered to the truth that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. When we grasp that, when we surrender that, we are saved. Even if our behavior hasn't followed. Because here's the reality, and I think it's so important to realize this. If you are saved, the Bible says the Holy Spirit lives within you. And God's wisdom is a part of that, which is what we talked about today. And there will be changes that take place in your life. They may be very slow, and they may be slow coming, but they will happen. But if they're not present at the present time, that's where we return to the Lord, we confess our sins, and we give ourselves to the Lord again. And we ask Him, as James said in one five, for that wisdom. We ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember a pastor that I, I love once said this. There were people in the congregation talking to him. And he says, you're always talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do you do that? He said, because I leak. And the reality is we leak. I think that's why being here every week and gathering, why being in the Word of God every day, as Emily was talking about, why those things are so important, because our relationship with the Lord needs to be constantly, constantly moving forward. And if it's not... It's like being on an escalator. You don't stand still. You will go backwards. And if you aren't cultivating on a daily and hopefully a moment-by-moment relationship with the Lord, you will leak out and you'll start acting like an unbeliever. And it happens to all of us. And we never get to a point saying, well, I've got that one done. Again, the whole issue of even wisdom is that we may be wise today and a total fool tomorrow. And it's us 
walking with the Lord. Which brings us to communion and why it's so important. When we gather and take communion, it really is an opportunity to evaluate our lives. Yes, Jesus, I do believe that when you hung on that cross, you died for me. You took my punishment.